Hello and welcome to episode 20 of Cold Case Christmas. In this episode, we're investigating the strange disappearance of a 24-year-old man recently graduated with his whole life ahead of him. He went out with his mother, his sister and his best friend to a comedy show. After the show, he decided to stay out and he was never seen again. Now, there's lots of information online about this case, even though when it was suggested to me by a member of Michelle After Dark, I'd never heard of this case, honestly. But there's a bunch of information and I'm only going to be able to touch the surface of uh, what has come out about this case in this episode because these are meant to be kind of short, concise videos. So I'll leave a bunch of links in the description box so that you can dig into this case further if you would like to. And potentially this case sadly has quite a sinister twist to it. This is the strange disappearance of Kyle Fleischman. Twenty-four year old Kyle came from a close family. His parents are Dick and Barbara Fleischman, and he was their firstborn child, and he has two younger siblings, a sister and a brother. The family had relocated to Charlotte in North Carolina in the year 2000 because of Dick's job. Kyle graduated from Elon College in 2006 with a degree in administration. Kyle, by all accounts, was a caring, trusting young man. He made friends easily, he would talk to anybody, and he would just wanted to lift your spirits. And when his mother Barbara was diagnosed with breast cancer, Kyle told her that they would beat it together. He was always by her side, and he was her biggest supporter through her hard times. That is, until November 8th, 2007. Kyle, Barbara and his sister met up at the house of Kyle's best friend Daniel. The four of them took a cab to Dane Cook Comedy Show to help brighten Barbara's spirits after her cancer diagnosis. After the show Barbara and Kyle's sister went home and Kyle went with Daniel to a popular bar. This is the Bookhead Saloon in downtown Charlotte. They had a few drinks there but Daniel had to work the next day, so decided to leave about 1am. And when he left, he saw Kyle talking with a girl. And he went over to Kyle and said, are you coming with me or are you going to stay? Kyle said he was going to stay for a while, was enjoying chatting to this young lady. And he'd made a few new friends and was just going to hang out for a bit longer. Daniel said that Kyle didn't appear to be intoxicated when he left the bar. Well, he's having a good time, you know. Daniel thought, you know, Kyle's a big lad, he can look after himself, he's gonna be fine on his own. And he left to go to bed because he had to work the next morning. Now, here's where things get pretty sketchy, honestly. And there are some inconsistencies in what's reported online, but I think probably because there's a little bit of confusion about Kyle's movements after he left that bar. Now, I found this really long and detailed post on Reddit, and I know that not all information on Reddit is uh, reliable, but the timeline pretty much checks out with some of the other articles I've read on the case. So I'll leave a link to it in the description box and you can obviously make the decision as to how much of it you wanna take at face value or whatever. So it comes from a Charlotte resident who has um, interviewed some people connected to the case, including a private investigator who was brought on board by Kyle's family and certain witnesses to the events of the night and certain suspicious circumstances that potentially take this case down a very sinister path. So I'm going to read you the timeline that's uh, on this Reddit post and like I said, you know, take it as you will, but this broadly does check out with other articles that I've read. So the timeline starts on Friday, November 9th, 2007, about 12.15 a.m. Dan closes his bar tab and tells Kyle he's leaving. Kyle says he's staying 
and will call a cab to Dan's later. So between about 1am and 2.15, Kyle chats, dances and just has a good time with a young female at the bar. So this is presumably the young woman that Daniel saw before he left. A surveillance video sees Kyle on camera in the saloon. And then about 2 a.m., this is alleged, comes from Kyle's uncle on the Vanished podcast, but the private investigators also confirm this, that there was a mild verbal altercation in the bar with a male connected to the female that Kyle had been with. So that's either her boyfriend or her husband, maybe, who wasn't very happy with Kyle talking to this young woman. 2.17 a.m., and the woman that Kyle has been with for the last hour or so, she leaves the bar. At 2.19 a.m., Kyle's phone places a call to his sister. That goes unanswered. Presumably she's asleep by then. Kyle's seen on camera leaving, but leaves his jacket and his bank card in the saloon. Around 2.20 Kyle has a brief exchange of words with several guys who are standing outside with the woman that he's danced with earlier in the night. And there's apparently some shouting and something happened at closing time outside of that bar. Now at 2.20, Kyle's seen on camera walking on North College Street. Between 2.22 and 2.45 a.m., allegedly, according to Dick, Kyle's dad, Kyle goes to fuel pizza. An employee there claims to have a photographic memory and says that Kyle ordered two slices of Meat Lover's Pizza, went to the toilet, and then they got busy. He didn't see Kyle leaving. At 2.42 a.m., Kyle's phone places a call to a business he went to earlier in the night, so I don't know whether that was the bar, but that was unanswered, presumably because everyone had gone home. Maybe he's realised that he's left his bank card in the bar and he wanted to go back for it. Also at 2.42 a.m., Kyle's phone places a call to his own voicemail. Between 2.42 and 2.57, Kyle's phone then calls Dick three times to both his cell number and his work number. Now, Dick was in Raleigh that night, staying at a hotel for work, and it's the middle of the night, so that call was unanswered as well. At 3 a.m., Kyle's phone calls his sister again. Presumably he's needing a lift. He's stranded, he's no bank card. So perhaps he needs someone to pick him up. That call goes unanswered as well. At 3.28 a.m., Kyle then calls Dan. And that's unanswered, because Dan had to work the next morning, so he's in bed. At 3.29, Kyle's phone then places a call to Bruce, his roommate. Bruce is also unavailable, and that call goes unanswered. And that was the last call. At 4 a.m., Kyle's phone is either now dead or it's been turned off. According to this person on Reddit, each call lasts only seconds. Some calls don't show up on the receiver's phone, but they're known to have been placed due to his phone records, which I find really interesting. So also, according to this uh, Reddit post, the private investigator said he personally went to collect Kyle's jacket and bank card from the bar and was able to view the bar's video footage. And he believes that Kyle appeared to be intoxicated. Now, when Dan left, he said Kyle didn't appear to be too intoxicated. So... Maybe he'd been spiked or maybe he'd just been, you know, knocking the drinks back, having a good time after Dan left. Also, the PI said that he didn't believe that the call placed from Kyle's phone to a business he visited earlier that night, whatever that means, was to that bar, to Buckhead Saloon. But take that for what you will. Four days after Kyle's disappearance, a taxi driver claimed that he saw Kyle walking down North Davidson Street by himself. Although there's conflicting reports on this because the taxi driver could be mistaken. The description that he gave of the young man's clothing 
isn't consistent with what Kyle was wearing that night. That night he was wearing jeans, a black t-shirt and black dress shoes. And the taxi driver himself said he wasn't sure, it could be him, but he's not sure. The police were able to do some tracking of Kyle's phone and found that his phone pings left a trail from Fuel Pizza down North Davidson Street until 4am. So is the taxi driver right? Now this part of town and this street in particular does have a reputation for gang activity and why was Kyle there? Kyle knew that part of town was dangerous and most probably wouldn't have gone there on his own. His phone puts him at the entrance of Cordelia Park, notorious place for drug and gang activity. So was it Kyle that was there or was his phone there? Because that's about two miles away from the Buckhead Saloon. He didn't have a coat, remember? Why was he walking all that way? He was potentially ringing people for lifts. What was he doing all of that way out of his comfort zone, so to speak? The police brought in two search dogs. The dogs were given Kyle's scent from the jacket he'd been wearing that he left at the bar. And both dogs independently took their handlers down to Fuel Pizza and made a big loop around it. This has led to a potential theory that he thought someone was following him. Maybe he left the pizza store, thought someone was following him, and he did a loop to try to lose them. Now, this is where reports get inconsistent because one article said that the dogs continued down North Davidson Street, which is where the taxi driver thought he saw, well, someone that looked like Kyle. But the Reddit poster says that the dogs followed Kyle sent from Fuel Pizza down 6th Street and then down North Brevard Street. So did these dogs track him down Davidson or Brevard? It's also been reported that the same dogs tracked Kyle sent past the park into a construction area about 200 yards away. And the handler claimed that when she got close to the construction site, she could smell death, a very strong smell, whether it be a dead animal or possibly a human. They brought in cadaver dogs, but found nothing. The Reddit poster had a conversation with someone called Mary, not her real name, who lived near the construction site. She submitted a tip to the police department stating that there was a foul odour at the construction site beside her home. She also claims to have witnessed two men and a red truck at this construction site in the middle of the night. She said she noticed that strong odour in the days following Kyle's disappearance and it lasted for several days. Now, could any of this link to Kyle? It's all speculation. We don't know what happened to Kyle. He's just yet another of the thousands of people who just disappear and are never seen again. And as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of inconsistencies about the specifics of what happened after Kyle left the Buckhead Saloon. But what happened to him? We may never know. But check out the links that I'll put in the description box. Let me know what you think about this case and I'll see you in the next episode of Cold Case Christmas. Bye, guys.